No, don't try to figure out all the answers. If you're trying to figure out all the answers, you're missing the point. Jesus Christ will return again. And there's plenty of things that's going to happen, some of them going on now, that can make you doubt and wonder, but you don't need to. Because you are born again, you have the promise of God, you will be rescued, whether it's raptured up, whether it's when you die, what, whatever it is, you will meet Jesus face to face and you will spend eternity with Him if you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And Awana's Wednesday night, we started uh, back and we actually got our books for the first time for Trek. And we went over that very thing and how Satan comes in. We're fighting a spiritual battle. Come on. But even with the words that we have. So we talked about the word believe and what that meant. And how I can believe certain things. But faith, believe also. Faith makes me think of a little bit more than that. But even the way that faith is used in the world today, it's watered down. That's not a coincidence. That's because Satan is trying to even water down words so that we don't understand their biblical meaning. But we'll get to that in a minute. So even our Advent candles, they're all over the place on what they are. Don't let that bother you. Don't let that lose focus. Debbie Googled. Google, you always get the answers, right? And Kim did too. And they came, you both came up with the same one, right? Peace? peace, but I say it's faith, and you can Google that and get that too. Am I right? Well, of course I, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> They're just as right, okay? But what we're doing so you're not confused is hope, because if we have hope, then all these things come together. Faith, faith actually is what brings about our hope, but we have hope because of our faith, and then the word faith, if you understand that, the Greek word pistis, and even the, the word in the Hebrew, which I don't know what it is, means the same thing. It's like the Shema. If you hear, you obey. If you have faith, you are faithful. So we could call that candle faithful and that'd make a little more sense probably. Because of our hope in Jesus Christ, because of the faith that we have, we become faithful, which gives us joy like no other. That we can be joyful even in times of stress and difficulty and, and persevere, uh, not perseverance, persecution and so forth. And then we have peace. Because it doesn't matter what happens to us. We know that the victory is Jesus Christ. <sighs> Praise be to God because of Jesus it's all about Jesus. And then in the center is the Christ candle, the light of the world, purity, which we're supposed to follow after him in his footsteps until he returns. And if you don't believe these simple things, and I love the candles for that reason, then you need to go back and examine at the very beginning and see if you really do have hope. Because if you're not transforming, if you're not changing into the image of Christ, if you're not falling in love with Him more and more because of the things that God does for you, even in terrible, terrible times, then you don't realize God's love for you. Hope, faith, joy, peace, all centered around Jesus Christ. He commands us, He empowers us to live a life of purity and holiness until his second advent, when he returns. And maybe you can think of all the scriptures, and I can think of one right now that we read in Revelation chapter 3, where, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And we hear that constantly as an altar call verse. But if you read that passage, you'll realize it's Jesus saying, You've shut me out. You, you shut the door on me. You once said you love me, but now you've put me outside. I'm standing here, I'm not going anywhere, but you've got to open the door and let me in. And if you do, I will have a relationship with you. We will be, you will know me and I will know you and I will declare you before the Father in heaven. Plain and simple. So do you have that relationship? So we're going with faith candle today. The second one is the faith candle or Bethlehem candle. And Micah prophesied that at the first advent that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. The second candle is also purple, if you notice it, 
representing the royalty of the king that is coming. So many people think of Jesus as a savior or a holy prophet, but is he your king of all kings? Is he the Messiah that he, who he said he is? Is he then Lord of all in your life? And if he is, your life will show it. You will live a life in preparation for the return of your king, who at that point will take you with him. Back in Jesus' time in the Roman Empire, when the, the armies would go out and have conquest, they would come back, and before they entered the city, they would camp outside of the city. The reason that they would do that is so the people of the city could come out and enjoy the victory with them before they came in and celebrated. What a neat concept, and it applies so much to us. We will celebrate with King Jesus as he reigns as promised. So let's look at faith a little bit, though, today. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. You probably know some of those verses. 10 kind of gets left out some. But 2, 8, 9 are for by grace you are saved through faith. It's not something that you can do, but it's a gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast about it. And verse 10, we are God's masterpiece or workmanship, however you want to say it, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. You cannot be a Christian and not be like Christ. It doesn't work that way. This is what God prepared in advance for us to do. This was the plan all the way from the beginning, all the way to the end. That mankind is poor, wretched, naked, blind. But because of his faith in Jesus Christ, you are a child of God. What a difference. All because of Jesus. Faith is what saves us. But what does faith mean? I mentioned that a little bit before. I have faith when I walk that my legs will carry me to the door. Right? I have faith when I sit down in a chair, that chair will hold me. Correct? I have faith when I go to bed that I will wake up the next morning. You see the fallacy in all those things? My legs will give out one day. That chair, it can break. It has happened to me before. And there's one day that I might not wake up unless Jesus returns first. But I put my faith in all of those things. But that's watering down what the biblical definition means. It'd be better to say I, I, I trust in those things pretty much. But they're not 100%. You know, faith is one of the only verses that's really defined, one of the only things that's really defined in the Bible. We tie a lot of other things together to, to come up with a definition of Trinity, for example, because you won't find that in the Bible per se. But you'll find faith. Debbie read about it this morning. Faith is commonly used today, but because it's not used properly, it's misunderstood. And because we fight a spiritual battle, don't think that that's not Satan's intent. He is wise and crafty, and he's been doing it forever and ever for us, you know, at least 6,000 years. And his point is to steal kill and destroy. That's from Jesus' own mouth. And that's what he wants to do with us. But faith is, now faith is the assurance of what we hope for and the certainty of we, what we cannot even see. Think about that for a minute. That we can have complete confidence and assurance and certainty to give us that hope that we have, to know that our faith is true so that we become faithful so that we have joy and peace unlike anyone else in this world because they put their joy and peace and their hope and their faith in material things. My health, the, the security of this building, the chair, the structures that we see, money, whatever it is. And then I put my hope that when I die, good is good enough or that it won't matter or that Jesus grades on a curve. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through Him. And we can have full assurance, confident faith, and know with certainty, without being able to see these things, that we have an eternity in heaven, that Jesus came once, and that He will return again to claim us for His own. 
Verse 2, this is why the ancients were commended. So we know that they're in this same boat as we are. Even though Jesus hadn't come yet, they are saved by faith. And we have all these Old Testament examples of how they lived because of their faith. Verse 3, by faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen has not been made out of what was visible. We cover that in Awana also, what it means to create something. And the very first child said, well, this chair was created. No, that chair was made out of things that were already here. Because the biblical definition of creation, again, is to make something out of nothing. And not only was it made out of nothing, but it was made every day that creation was made. It was good. We go back to Genesis and read it. Until mankind was made, and then it was made very good. Because man was made in the image of God. Without sin to be in a relationship with God. But we did sin. Story should be over. But because God is so loving, so kind, so faithful, so merciful, so just, He provided a way that would cost Him the life of His one and only Son because of how much He loves you. Wow. What a mighty God we serve. All praise, glory, and honor be to Him. Verse 4, By faith Abel offered. He did something. He did an offering. He offered because he understood that if he was a created being, that he had an obligation to the Creator. He offered a, God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith he was commended as righteous when God gave approval to his gifts. So there's an obligation, there's something that's done, there's a commendation for it, and that is righteousness. And by faith he still speaks, even though he is dead. This is eternal. Nothing can take your hope or security away from you. Verse 5, By faith Enoch was taken up so that he did not taste death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. If we live a righteous, holy life as God designed for us, it is pleasing to God. Our reasonable act of service, as Romans 12 says. It's the only thing that we can do, especially since God's Son gave His life for us. The only logical thing is to give our life back in homage to Him. It's what any Christian should do if they realize the love that God has for them. And Enoch didn't taste death as a result. Verse 6, And without faith, now we have the counterpart of that, it is impossible to please God. So I guess you'll taste death then, won't you, for all eternity? That would be the flip side of that coin. Because anyone who approaches Him must believe that He exists, is the first part, and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. Then we have an example of Noah, and that's where we ended the scripture from this morning. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, coming judgment the wrath of God. In godly fear, he built an ark to save his family, not only to save himself, but he knew how loving and kind and gracious God was, so he did it to save his family. By faith, he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness that comes by faith. Oh, there's so much in this scripture here. He condemned the world because of holy fear. Fear is the beginning of wisdom. Not that he was fearful of punishment, but he knew who God is. I didn't say was, he is. And who God will always be. And he deserves worship and praise from every being that we can even fathom. Because they're all created beings. And we see that when we get in Revelations 4 and 5, where John's in the throne room of God. Did you think about that? Man standing in the throne room of God. And he sees other men there, elders. And he sees other beings that he can't even describe, let alone he can't describe the throne room or anything else. And you can spend all your time trying to focus on what these things mean, or you can sit there and say, wow, man is standing in the throne room of God, worshiping him. There's the point. And we will be there if we believe, just like John was taken up, because he had to see the things that were going to come until mankind reigned with Jesus and God in heaven. Wow. He condemned the world 
Noah did, and became an heir. What is an heir? Someone who gets everything that the king has because he's more than likely his child. In this case, definitely because you're God's child. Faith is a lot more than assurance of something. It's a lot more than a mindset, but it begins with the mind and leads to the heart, just like you can put it together from Scripture all over. And then that heart process transforms and changes your mind so it tra changes your behavior. Quick summation of what should happen to you if, in fact, you are born again. And Jesus told Nicodemus, it doesn't matter how much religion you have, how much knowledge you have of the Bible, how much faith you have in other things like your security because of your heritage or because you go to church or because you're a good person, those things you can't put your trust and faith in. The only thing that you can put your trust and faith in is Jesus Christ because he is who he says he is. He is the Son of God, the Chosen One, the Alpha and the Omega. You see all these names from, from Revelation. And those names tell who you are in Jesus Christ and help you realize how you should react and live as a result. It produces a life based on faith that becomes faithful. Same Greek word, pistis. A life that gives you hope. Because of your faith, so you become faithful, brings you joy and peace, and then others see that, and they're drawn to Jesus Christ. And maybe, just maybe, as Peter says, you'll be given an opportunity to tell them the hope that is in you, if the hope is in you. James says this, in chapter 2, starting in verse 14, What good is it, my brothers, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? It has to be a living, breathing faith. Can such faith save them? James doesn't say it here, but I'll say it. No. <laughs> it's a rhetorical question. He goes on to say that, but it's not written right there. If you have faith that doesn't lead to actions, just think what Jesus said to many on that day. Depart from me, I do not know you. And their claim was, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. The whole world looked at us and said, we're saved. We did mighty works in your name. We even cast out demons in your name. Everyone thinks we're saved. Jesus said, not me. Apart from me, I don't know you. Because see, Jesus came to offer salvation if we'll believe and trust in him. And when he returns, he will either bring eternal life or he'll bring eternal death. Plain and simple. Can such faith save him? So James goes on to, to, to let you think about this. Suppose then, a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one tells him, go in peace, stay warm and be well fed, but does not provide for his physical needs, what good is that? So too, faith by itself, if it does not result in actions, is dead. But some will say, you have faith and I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith with my deeds. You can't show the faith. It's another rhetorical statement again. You can't show your faith without deeds. And James continues to build upon that. You believe that God is one. Good for you, because even the demons believe that, and they shudder where you probably don't. Oh, foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is worthless? Was not our father Abraham justified by what he did? And if you keep reading in Hebrews 11, you'll see what he did that, that God commended him for. By what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. You see that his faith was working with his actions and his faith was perfected by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And now we've got another promise, another name of a child of God. He was a friend of God. I'm God's friend. Not only can I approach the throne room like John did, but I'm his friend, his child. He desires so much to have a relationship with me that he would send his one and only son to die for me. Does that not bring you peace and joy and hope that sets you apart from the world? If it doesn't, you don't understand it. That, that kind of love has to change your life. 
If you were drowning and you knew you were drowning and my son's over here and I tossed him a life preserver instead of you, that would go with you for the rest of your life. That I let sacrifice my son to save you. If it didn't change you, then <laughs> something's wrong. God did that for you because he loves you so much. And you have one life to show him how much you love him in return. As you can see, a man is justified by his deeds and not by faith alone. Verse 25, in the same way was not even Rahab the prostitute justified by her actions when she welcomed the spies and sent them off on another route? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. James makes his point pretty clear. To use another illustration, and you may have heard it before, it's an old illustration, it's not my illustration. If you're at Niagara Falls and you see a guy do, going across Niagara Falls, maybe you've seen that before, um, on a tightrope, and he's pushing a wheelbarrow, and he does it several times, and you say, man, I feel confident, I have faith in this guy that he can push his wheelbarrow across. Then he gets his assistant in there with, her, with him. And he pushes that person across the tightrope. And you're like, whoa, he's pushing somebody now. Man. And then he asked you, will you get in the wheelbarrow? Oh, I guess your faith just became not faith, didn't it? Because there ain't no way I'm getting in that wheelbarrow. Right? Do you have faith in Jesus Christ? What's going on in your life right now which is challenging your faith? COVID? Election? What? Deaths? What? God is in complete control and He loves you to death. The death of His one and only Son. Do you have faith to get in that wheelbarrow and let Him push you wherever it goes so that you can get to the other side safely? I'm going to mash these verses together that we read from Ephesians and Hebrews and James. It is by grace that you're saved through faith. Now faith is the assurance of what we hope for and the certainty of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith they lived for God. Their actions proved it. <clears throat> by faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, he lived out his life in faith by what he did. By faith he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness that comes by faith. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? No. Faith by itself, if it does not result in actions, is dead. A man is justified by his deeds and not by faith alone. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. I'm going to ask you again, are you in that wheelbarrow? that God is pushing you through this life because it's not your own in the first place. You were purchased with a price from the gates of hell where you would spend all eternity because of what Jesus did to bring you hope, faith and faithfulness, joy and peace, all centered around Jesus Christ so you would live for Him and light up this world. It's not just intellectual, it's heartfelt, where it changes everything about your mind. So those things that you thought before were the things that you live for and the things that you had security in, you say, they don't matter. What matters is that I live for God and your actions prove it. Paul wrote this as a beautiful doxology to the church in Rome. In Romans chapter 16, Now to him who is able to strengthen you by my gospel and by the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery concealed for ages past. First Advent took care of some of those things. But now revealed and made known through the writings of the prophets by the command of the eternal God in order to lead all nations to the obedience that comes from faith. The direction that we should be heading as Christians until Jesus' second advent. Last verse of that uh, letter. To the only wise God be glory forever through Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen means truly, truly. You should have got that for that's one of the titles that Jesus said in his letters. I am the amen. Truly, truly, you can believe this. Verily, verily, I tell you, 
amen, you agree with it that this is the truth. If, in fact, God's Spirit dwells in you and communes with your spirit. Peter also had this to say. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8. Though you may not have seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Now that you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who foretold the grace to come to you searched and investigated carefully, trying to determine the time and the setting to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing. But they didn't find out, did they? You don't need to know the times or the season. What you do need to know is that you have the Spirit of God living in you and you are to be His witnesses to the world. Verse 12, It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you, when they foretold the things now announced by those who preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. Therefore, because of these things, prepare your minds for action. Be sober-minded. Let your hope fully set your hope fully on the grace to be given you at the revelation of Jesus Christ when He comes again. As obedient children, do not conform to the passions of your former ignorance. But just as He who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. Now let's apply that to Revelation since you all read it this week. In Revelation chapter 1, it starts this way. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what soon must take place or come to pass. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything that he saw. This is the word of God and testimony of Christ Jesus. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and obey what is written, because the time is near. Now, you might not think it's near. Everyone thought it was near in the first part of the church history. And it's nearer today. Jesus Christ will return. And in Revelation, you get a blessing just for reading it aloud. I haven't been reading mine aloud. I guess I'll go back and read it aloud. And you get a blessing if you obey. Two blessings promised there. Then you get seven letters to seven real churches. Then we went into the throne room of God. Chapters 2 and 3 are the letters. Chapters 4 and 5 are the throne room of God. And when first he's describing the throne room and the, and the beings there and that they're worshiping God. Second, he's describing who can open the, the seal on this scroll to see what is to come so that we know what to expect. Not that we'll understand everything but we'll know everything to expect so that we don't lose hope and faith and joy and peace. Okay? But in those seven churches, there's a little bit mentioned about faith. And then I'm going to have a video. After the video, I'll come up and we'll do communion together. In Revelation chapter 2, and this will tell us a little bit about how we know that we can have saving faith. This is the letter to the church at Pergamum and then the letter to the church at Thyatira. In Revelation 2.12, to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, These are the one who holds the sharp double-edged sword. The Word of God is Jesus. We can read about Him every single day in different translations and on video, uh, reading ourselves, reading aloud, you name it. There's no excuse driving in your car, wherever, there's no excuse that you're not hearing the Word of God. I know where you live, where the throne of Satan sits, yet you have fe held fast to my name and have not denied your faith in me. Is that true of you? Because Satan certainly lives here, in the land of the free and the home of the brave, right? Right? This Christian nation, Satan lives on his throne. Here, you better believe it. But I have a few things against you because some of you hold on to, and I'm going to add this in, change it a little bit, not change it, false teachings. If you read, you know that I'm right there. Because a lot of you don't even know what is said in here because you've just taken the word of some man, some sermon you've heard, some TV show you've heard and you don't even really know what is true here. 
Study God's Word to show that you're an approved workman. You're a worker for Him that knows how to handle this Word of God. And don't get into arguments and divisions because of what the Word of God says. Realize that if you're a believer that we are gathered together to be one body for Jesus Christ, His hands and feet in this world. Just as Jesus were walking here, we're walking it as a corporate body of, of believers until He returns. We should look like Jesus. Not be distracted, not be divided, not be focused on other things, but look like Jesus. Therefore repent, otherwise I will come to you shortly and wage war against them with the sword of my mouth. This will condemn you also. It says if you are a believer, if you are Jesus' friend, if you are his brother, you will obey his commandments. And the world will know that is real because of your love. Plain and simple. To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These are the words of the Son of God, uh, yes, whose eyes are like a blazing fire. He sees everywhere and he permeates and tells what's true or not. Whether you will be refined and made pure or whether you will not be. And whose feet are like polished bronze. Now, I'm just giving you a brief explanation, but you can go back and see what bronze means and everything else. But they're polished bronze. They're smooth. They're firm. And they will carry you all the way across that tightrope that we walk called life safely to the other side. Wow. God does it all for you. From the calling to the saving to the leading you home. And in between that is the empowered life that you live for God all because of God living in you. I know your deeds, your love, your faith, your service, your perseverance. Because you love, due to your faith, you will become faithful, you will give your service, and you will persevere till the end. And your latter deeds are greater than your first, but I do have this against you. You tolerate false teachers and false doctrines. We fight a spiritual battle. The church is so full of these false doctrines. And we get focused on them. And I don't want you to focus on trying to figure everything out in Revelation because you will miss the point. And almost everybody that I ever go across that's a Christian, what does this mean in Revelation? Tell me about this and check this out. Jesus will return. There's the point. Will you be ready to meet him face to face? Don't get distracted along the way because what's going to happen if you try to lean out of that wheelbarrow is you might fall out. Wouldn't be because anything the guy did pushing you. And it certainly won't be because anything Jesus did. He will safely carry you to the other side. Faith and faithfulness are the same thing. So does your life prove the genuineness of your faith? After we have the video, I'll come up and we'll have communion together and then Debbie will close us. Yes, Merle.